Churchill remains a potent figure in our national identity as the wartime Prime Minister who defended us against the Nazis. This is an extract from Leo Amory's diaries. Amory was the Secretary of State for India, so he's in charge of Indian policy in London. And this is the bit I really wanted to show you. He writes in his diary that Churchill has burst out with this statement. I hate Indians. Oh they are a beastly people with a beastly religion. I've heard it described that Churchill had these racist views against Indian people, but I wasn't expecting it to be so blunt. He has this kind of eugenics, 19th century informed idea of how Indians so are inferior to, to Western people. Churchill's attitudes towards India had consequences. In 1943, failed harvests and wartime blockades led to a famine in Bengal. As it was part of the British Empire, they turned to London for help, but very little came. By the end of 1943, three million people were dead of starvation and disease. The question is, could they have done something from London? Could they have thought about ways of alleviating this? Could they have planned ahead? Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing here is this is Churchill's handwriting. This is the little oh, wow. comment from, from Churchill. And it's, it's a bit enigmatic. It says, what does this mean to you? So he had personally seen this, which is warning of how dire the situation in India is. The critical thing is shipping. And what Churchill's just prioritising the whole time is the winning of the war. He's just thinking about where, where are ships, where can we move men who are needed on fronts. And the, the, the lives of Bengali peasants uh, are neither here nor there to him. When Australia and Canada offered aid, Churchill rejected it. And Yasmin thinks she knows why. Ah, here we are. Winston, after a preliminary flourish on Indians breeding like rabbits. God, that's really it's like eugenicist type language. It's also the fact that it's in the same breath as discussions about shipping mm. and, and delivery of aid to the famine. So it's that kind of connection between mm. his beliefs about Indians mm. and the actual relief of the famine. Mm. And I think that's what's really pernicious. So what does this mean for Churchill's legacy? Most historians would, would tend to agree that hundreds of thousands could have been saved. The, the famine itself was beyond Churchill's control, but it's about how relief was managed. In Churchill's case, I think there's a punitive and slightly malicious um, element there, which means he, he turns his face away from sending aid when he could have done. So this wasn't just wrong, it was nasty. I think in Churchill's case, he was, yeah, nasty. I think this other side of Churchill should be part of our national story. But to see if I can get traditionalists to agree, I'm taking my case to the so-called honourable member for the 18th century, MP Jacob Rees-Mogg. I would like us to have a more nuanced recollection to figures like Churchill, who obviously helped Britain win the war, but at the same time um, said and did things that I think many people would regard as reprehensible. Um the question with Churchill is, is winning the war of such overwhelming importance that the things he said about various subjects early in his career uh, can be overlooked? And I think in truth it is. I certainly accept that uh, he had views about um, some forms of military action. He even at one point flirts with eugenics. But they're relatively trivial compared to that overwhelming victory against one of the greatest evils the world has ever seen. Is it fair to call them trivial? Some of his contemporaries, like Lord Amory, said they feared that Churchill's racism towards Indians, for example, which was well known at the time, was actually clouding his judgment about uh, shipping during the war. I, I think he clearly gets India wrong. The difficulties during the war in shipping are very profound. There isn't um, an excess of, of shipping. It's a very difficult balancing act for him to, to get right. So I, I think that is a harsh judgment. But does it have to be an either or? Do you think a country needs heroes that we simply celebrate and don't talk about the more complicated issues? Oh, I think we should certainly talk about the most, more complicated issues. We should certainly talk about where people have got things wrong. You know, this is all about nuance and that there is nobody who hasn't done something that is wrong, made a mistake. And what could 
we do, in your opinion, to bring that nuance to the public spaces where they stand on plinths? Do you think we should put plaques there? Oh, I can't think of anything more boring. Who is going <laughs> to stand in front of statue reading some tiresome, <laughs> long-winded footnotes saying, um, though you might think that this fellow is a really great hero, you must bear in mind that uh, under certain circumstances, when under pressure and uh, subject to Clause 5 of the Prevention of Annoying People with Boring Messages on Statues Act, 1832, <laughs> who did something... I mean, but you so talked dull. about nuance. I, there, there's nothing nuanced about a statue. It's hero, glorious, the end. I think you can represent it uh, in museums and in, in history courses. But I think to have a counter statue for every hero showing the things they did wrong uh, wouldn't serve any useful purpose.